And fund managers and financial advisors, they need to be sent back to school to study economic and market history. That's according to a new report. The Chartered Financial Analyst Society in the UK has hit out at financial amnesia, as they call it, shown by institutional investors. And they're arguing that a failure to understand the past is a key factor behind recent financial crises. Uh, practical history lessons for financial workers and an annual amnesia check are two reforms being suggested by the CFA. Um, I, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not one who'd want a, an annual amnesia check. I, I think I'd, I'd forget probably to get the check up about what to forget. But uh, do investors need to focus on more history? Uh, Guy Lebas is still with us. Uh, Ed Butolsky also still with us. Do you think that we have things that we still need to learn from history or is, is every lesson a lesson in its own and you first know after you've gone through it? Guy. Well, I think w w one of the stories here is that history doesn't quite repeat itself, but it does rhyme to some degree. You know, whether we can identify those rhymes, I think, is a bigger question than whether we're actually forgetting the history, so to speak. And, and it's very easy to make the excuse, this time is different. And many people have been sort of s stating that in the wake of the economic recovery here in the U.S. And thus far, they've actually been right. So history can't be relied on as sort of the single guide to expect what's going on in the future, certainly. But one of the things that I would add to that is, you know, you would talk about having amnesia. I think a lot of people haven't had the knowledge to begin with. I mean, if you look at my industry, which is the financial services industry, where we are financial advisors, the training in our industry is horrible. You know, if you think about it, 98% of the risk and 93% of the return in a portfolio comes from the architecture and construction of the portfolio. At the same time, they do not teach that at most investment firms when they train financial advisors. You'd be shocked at how little knowledge about portfolio construction goes on and here we are on the front line talking with and working with clients every single day so I think what you really have to talk about is not so much amnesia it's just getting back to investments 101 and investments 102 because we're out there showing clients how to manage their money and we have to do a better job our industry in learning first then going out and teaching it yeah, Guy, uh, Ed, uh, I'm just looking at some of the viewer comments coming in while, while you've been speaking as well. Uh, we were asking, uh, well, we were talking about amnesia and financial market amnesia and asking what goldfish have in common with investors. And goldfish, we use those pictures because goldfish apparently forget a lot, right? But uh, J2Loves Friday tweets in and says uh, regarding what goldfish and markets have in common, both wet too often, both stuck in glass bowls and stared at too closely all day long. Maybe that's what happens to you if you are stared at all day long. Your eyes go all bonkers, right? <laughs> anyway, Julia, uh, forgetting, uh, forgetting, forgetting yeah, the script here for there, a moment. There, there's the castle. There's the castle, and there's the there's the financial bubble. I, I like these guys' uh, well, noses. Have you seen their noses? I didn't know yeah. that goldfish they have noses, but <laughs> I know that now. I guess. <laughs> Well, Louisa, the final preparations are being made in Times Square for the big New Year's Eve bash, uh, which is going to be happening this weekend. But before the ball drops on 2012, we'll get some market predictions for the year ahead when we come right back. Thanks so much, Louisa. Well, we're still joined by Guy Laba and Ed Butowski. Guy, uh, you're a fixed income strategist for Jenny Montgomery Scott. What is your outlook for fixed income for 2012? Well, I think we have a couple of things we're looking forward to. Number one is a relatively benign climate for interest rates, which is based on two things. Uh, number one, kind of the refusal of policymakers to aggressively address some of the issues that are facing the market on a day-to-day -day basis, both in Europe here in the U.S. And number two, when we look sort of beyond just interest rates, we're actually looking for risk assets, particularly non-financial high-yield corporates and sort of munis that are in the A-rated, even triple B-rated ratings range as performing better than the broader markets. And I think the story there really is, well, these entities, they don't have a lot of connection to Europe directly, and we believe the markets will come to realize this really probably likely in the latter half, middle part of 2012. And so in terms of the relation with relationship to Europe and, and opportunities both abroad and here in the U.S., do you see a decoupling between Europe and the U.S.? Yeah, to, to a fairly strong degree, at least in terms of financial performance. You know, we can easily envision a scenario in which there are some deep challenges that European financial institutions and even European non-financials who are directly connected to those lenders within the continent really have problems, but it's somewhat divorced from the U.S. markets. Again, when it comes to non-financial corporations in the U.S., the global financial system is still so deeply intertwined, we're hesitant to jump in the U.S. financials at this point.
Um, yeah, Ed, I'm just looking through uh, some of the email commentary that's coming through from, from you viewers out there. Uh, Justine writes in and says, how refreshing to hear you talk about the free market uh, and not be one of the usual stooges. You're not afraid to say it how it is. And then the other side of the coin, you also have people then writing in, like uh, uh, Mark Dow tweets in and he says, ask free market guy if it was such a good idea to let Lehman fail. Uh, everyone says that they're free market until they're punched in the face. Well, look, it's, it's very, very tough. I mean, I am a free market guy, and there's no question about it that, you know, was it a good idea to have Lehman Brothers fail? I mean, I think we have to take a step back and look at, you know, what had been created prior to that. Everything is so systemic. Everything is so connected. Uh, would I have allowed, you know, let Lehman fail? Would, it, would Bear Stearns have failed? Quite frankly, I would have. I, I truly believe that we should just let things find its natural bottom and, uh, and deal with the ramifications from that. And, Ed, does that mean then that we should uh, let Greece go? Should we potentially if we see a run mm -hmm. on yields heading into the first quarter should we let some of the periphery countries and I put them in plural because we've seen a big run so far and there is a fear that we could see that once again yeah, I, I certainly would, you know, Greece in itself, in terms of looking at the world economic picture, you know, I, you know, I would love to go to Greece. I've never been there. Uh, but at the same time, I do believe that you just let things find its natural bottom. Uh, that's how this, this, that's how things should be. So I certainly would have let Greece, you know, certainly let Greece go. And I certainly probably, you know, most likely, you know, let Lehman Brothers go. We should have also done that with Bear Stearns and some of the other uh, big institutions. Ed, let's take a quick look at where our futures are trading right now. Uh, it looks like the, the Dow, if it were to open now, would be about 25 and a half points higher. S&P 500 pointing to a higher open of about three points. NASDAQ mm -hmm. looking like its uh, futures are pointing down by about half a point. So the big question now, we just have a couple of trading days left in 2011. What does 2012 have in store for us? Ed, what are you expecting uh, coming up in the first half? And uh, especially the first half of 2012. Right. And, you know, obviously it's very tough to tell, you know, month by month. But generally speaking, what I see is I see a rise in interest rates on the long end. The short end, I think we're going to keep those fairly, you know, stable at this point. I think you can see interest rates start to rise from just natural trading. I think the areas that you should focus on are utilities. I think when the markets went down in 2008, you saw utility stocks go down. Normally they're fairly defensive. Money came back into the market, stocks rose. They didn't go into utilities. So you still pick up about four and a half, five percent yield on utilities, you'll probably see a nice total return out of the utility index. There's still a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines. Mm -hmm. Will that money come back into the market and will it still be very risk averse? Well, what you're seeing, and people don't realize this, that what's moving the markets right now are not individuals. It's all program trading. And you have these huge swings and these huge, this enormous amount of volatility. And because of that, people are going to sit on the sidelines because they just don't know what to do. And with the access to information every single day, 24-7, people have literally become, you know, have inherent inertia. They just don't want to move. So I I think you're going to continue to see a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines. Um, and again, it's hard to do it, but you know, right now is the time to start committing money into, I believe, utilities and looking at other you know, dividend paying stocks. Okay, so you're so saying what's the utilities. Time for those recommendations? I'm sorry. What, what's the time horizon for those recommendations, Ed? Because obviously, with the, the short term mm -hmm. market volatility, that poses a you know, problem for individuals who are, sure. or firms who are looking at a three month horizon or a one month horizon. Yeah, you start investing right now. I mean, I've been a heavy investor in utilities for the last 18 months. Um, I don't think you try to time this. I think you just look at yourself and say, hey, I'm a long term investor. And uh, anybody who's a short term investor shouldn't be investing. You're a long term investor. There's value. Stocks today are about 21% undervalued based on where earnings estimates are and where interest rates are. You just start investing don't overthink it just invest okay so, so you're saying Ed, just get into the market now slowly but surely and find some of the dividend paying uh, mm -hmm. stocks out there some of the utilities as you were just saying as well um, Guy, what would your favorite mm -hmm. trade be here within the next uh, well short to medium term horizon I guess I think in the short to medium term, we actually like Australian uh, AUD denominated government debt for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, the relative level of interest rates just because of inflation and currency trends in Australia is a little bit higher here in the U.S. And two, uh, and this is sort of the big point, has really been that the flight to quality in U.S. assets has been a little bit overblown. It's almost been at the expense of nearly every other currency around the, around the world. And so we think there's a potential for a little bit of rebound over the course of the early part of 2012. I want to thank you both for joining us. Guy, mm -hmm. Ed, thanks so much for, for waking up this early hour here in the United States. We've been joined this hour by Guy Lebon, Chief Fixed Income Strategist for Janney Montgomery Scott, as well as Ed Butow. Managing Partner at Chapwood Investments.